Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you, Clyde. <coughs> you did a super job. Well, we are going to conclude our series called The Christian and Politics. This time, for part two, we're going to talk about when government goes wrong. Now, this is a highly emotional topic for many of us. And it is even hard for us to talk about politics in public. That's why they say religion and politics are two things you should bring up in polite company. Politics has become so charged that we have a hard time talking about the issues with people who disagree with us. We have a very, very difficult time doing that. And so what I want to do in this series is not only give us an opportunity to hear what God's view is around how we should engage government, but also to create enough distance and space around our emotional reaction to politics that we can actually start to have dialogue and conversation about it. And again, if the church can't figure this out, we're in trouble. I'm sure that on several issues, there's people in this room that I have a different view than they have. But I love you. You're my family. You're more important to me than politics. So if we can't figure that out, then we're going to have a really hard time. So having said that, we're going to take a look first back at where we've been, and then we're going to go forward. So, in part one, one of the first things we talked about was that since God establishes civil authorities, Christians should be law-abiding citizens and show leaders the proper respect. We should follow the laws of our land, and we should show leaders the honor that they deserve. That should influence how we speak about them, how we address them, whether or not we follow customs, that sort of thing. Next, the church and state are different things and God's way does not equal a political party or form of government. I love this country. I do. I'm, I'm a patriot, actually. People are surprised. <laughs> but I am. I love this country. I've served in government, not because that was the only job I could get, but because I want to serve my citizens, my fellow citizens. So having said that, and I, I would not want to live in any other country or any other place. I've seen a lot. And this is the only country I really want to live. Well, that's not exactly true. You know. <laughs> Someone offered me a uh, mansion in Jamaica. I said, Irie. <laughs> but barring significant circumstances, of all things being equal, this is the only country in which I want to live. Having said that, America is not God's chosen nation. It's not. There, there is no chosen nature, nation anymore. What Christ did tore the veil. By his blood, all Gentiles are grafted into the tree. And we all have access to the promises of God. No longer does he have a specific nation that he's working with. He's drawing all men to himself. Amen? So it's not about a particular government. It's not about Democrat or Republican. It's not about democracy. None of those things represent God. Certainly some of those things reflect aspects of God's character but don't get it confused. Do not think that the, there is something special 
about America when it comes to God. Why is that helpful? Why am I saying that? Because when we think about how America deals with other countries and how we think about things even in this country, it's important for us to understand that God has a purpose and plan for all his kids, all his children. That there is no particular group that is more loved by God than another group. <clears throat> when God looks at the world, he doesn't see a map with lines on it. There are no map, there's no lines on his map. He just sees his kids. You follow? And so when we're thinking about politics, we have to be careful that we don't throw God into the mix because that's not the realm where he belongs. We'll say more about that in just a second. While the Bible does not directly address participatory government, there is evidence to support our active engagement. So even though the Bible doesn't say you should vote, I think there's evidence by the way Christ lived and how the apostles lived to indicate that we should be actively um, engaged in government. We should do the duties of a citizen. Now, sometimes that's hard to do. One of the things that I heard, heard a lot is like, I don't, I have a hard time voting because I don't like who's on the ballot. But by not voting, your demographic, your people is not represented. And when you don't vote, it sends a message to our leaders that I don't really need to consider you or your group. So we need to step up and be heard. All of us. And there are more options than the names that appear on the ballot. Any one of us can write in a name. So there's more options than just the two that are often offered up. We need to vote. We need to do our part. We need to be involved and engaged. When considering policies, we should choose that those that best enable us to love God and love others as ourselves. And I said this before, I'll say it again. What I'm saying is that we need to involve God in how we think about policies. We need to look at the example of Jesus Christ when thinking about policies. We could look at the same information and come to a different conclusion. That's okay, because as long as Jesus is the focus, you and I can still get along. You and I can still relate to each other. Because if the focus on Jesus, where Jesus is, the Holy Spirit, and where the Father are, there is communion, there is relationship. <coughs> Amen? So as long as we're keeping Jesus in the focus, we can disagree without disliking. We can disagree without disrespect. We can disagree without me assuming that you love our country less. Or you're less American or less patriotic. So we should, in every aspect of our life, Involve God. Think about what He would want. Think about um, the, the kingdom. We should be kingdom minded. And think about what ushers in the kingdom and allows for God to flow the most in and around us. And following, and, and following, and lastly, when considering candidates and policies, we should first consider Jesus' teaching <coughs> and actions. Sometimes we in order to justify our stances, we'll pull out isolated scripture and say, see, because this says this now, this is how I'm voting, this is the policy I support. Whereas I think the issues are more complex than that, and I think we should look to the life and the teachings of Jesus first, and, and look to sections of scripture where there's actually teaching on that thing. Now there's not going to be that for everything, but I think for most things we can find something that's analogous in the Bible and look at where either the apostles or Jesus actually taught about that thing. When we wanted to find out about government, we went to Romans 13 where 
Paul is actually teaching about government. You follow? I didn't go to some isolated scripture in Isaiah, one line, and, and pull my theology of how to engage government with that. I went to where it's actually taught, and I looked at the life of Jesus. That's what we need to do. Amen? And not just fall into the trap of um, saying things like, you know, I base my abortion policy because, or uh, my issue, my LGBT policy on the fact that God made Adam and Eve. Right? Now, that is true. God did make Adam and Eve. But that's not where you should draw from to get your policy. There's a lot of other places where things are specifically talk, taught about where you can get your policy. You might come to the same conclusion, but I'm just saying let's have a much more solid foundation, scriptural foundation, to stand on. Not just some isolated scripture that's taught and talking about something else. Now, as I'm bringing up these examples, I'm not revealing my political views. I'm not saying one way or another what I think. If you want to know what I think, we can go, you can buy me a beer, I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> I'm just using these examples because I think it's good to ground what we're talking about in real life and not just talk in speculation because the conversation you're having about politics are not in some classroom somewhere. They're in real life, so we're going to use some real life examples. Is everyone with me so far? Any comments, questions, thoughts on part one? You good? Yes? Excellent, excellent. This is all fine and good <laughs> when governments act the way they should. What about when they don't? Because governments are made up of people and people are fallible. What happens when governments make mistakes? So the first thing I want to do is make a distinction. So there is a way that government can mess up, where they act in a way that prevents us from loving God and loving others. But then, so in other words, there's things that government can do that prevent us from following God's ways. But there's also ways in which government can act where they allow things to happen that we don't like. You see the difference between those two? Preventing us from being versus acting in a way, extending rights that we don't necessarily agree with, things that we consider immoral or, or something like that. Now, I'm going to address the second one first. When government acts in a way that we, that we disagree with, without preventing us from exercising our faith, we need to work within the system for change. We need to use the things that are available to us as citizens of this country to affect change. Now, what are some of those things? Voting, I already mentioned. We can talk to legislators. We can join uh, organizations that are working towards change. We can send donations into organizations that are working towards the change that we want to see. We have that right as citizens to do, and that is fine for you to do. Here's the caveat though, just something to keep in mind. We don't change hearts through laws. We don't change hearts through laws. The opposite is true though. We can change laws by changing hearts. And the example we see in the apostles and with Jesus is that they set out to change hearts, not laws. Otherwise, Jesus would have come to earth and started a campaign to become the high priest. He would work real hard to become the high priest. And then as the high priest, he could affect change. He could change laws and everything. But no, where was Jesus? He was on the streets. He was in the neighborhoods. He was talking to people, teaching them by the hillside. So just let's just be careful about our perspective of getting involved with these things to change that our faith does not spread by the changing of laws, but it's by relationships. It's changing hearts. It's changing minds. So don't think, Pasadena didn't say that you can't get involved in causes that you care about. That's not what I said. I'm just saying be careful when you're just seeking to change laws and not engaging people. 
and not talking to them, not changing their heart. Because they'll resent that law. The reason why laws that we don't like get passed is because people's hearts have changed and turned against God. And so I think the, the best arena to come against that is one, in your prayer closet, and two, on your street with your neighbors at your job. Amen? So now let's get at the first one. What happens when government acts in a way that prevents us from loving God and loving others? And what do I mean by that? So here's sort of five things that sort of fit in that category. And they are laws seeking to limit our religious expression, laws that unfairly target a people group. Now, if Jesus said, hey, two greatest commandments, love God and love your neighbor. If there are laws that discriminate against my neighbor and prevent me from having the kind of relationship that God wants me to have, where it's self-sacrificial, mutually beneficial, mutually independent, if I can't have that relationship with any other human being, that's a problem for me. Discrimination against another group is a problem for me because that is my neighbor. And if God commands me to, to love God and love neighbor, and if there's a section of the population that some of my neighbors are discriminated against, then I can't fulfill God's command. You follow how that works? So when you think God's way, we think differently about the people around us. We see it a little bit differently. We see also in this category, our rights are unfairly denied to a people group. Punishments are unfairly administered or disproportional. Not punishing private citizens or groups who do any of the above. This last one is, is also key. When the government doesn't act to restrict people's rights, but looks the other way when other citizens do that, that's just as bad. We saw that in our own country, where after the Civil War, we saw countless lynchings. <coughs> it wasn't often done by the government, or else we don't know, sometimes there were hoods. But the authorities looked the other way. They said, that's okay. And so by looking the other way, it's basically like the government's doing it themselves. So that's something else that we need to be concerned about as citizens. Even when other citizens are doing the oppression and the government doesn't do anything about it, we have a problem with government. We have a problem with government. Any questions about this or thoughts about it? So when I say when government goes wrong, these are the types of things I'm talking about. And the, as far as the, this topic is concerned, what's good about it is that this is sort of the context where many of the books of the New Testament were, were written. The church was under acute oppression, and they were being targeted, and they were being jailed, and they were being murdered, and it was both... The government doing it and private citizens doing it. And it's in this world where much of the New Testament books, many of the New Testament books were written. And if you look at the story of the Acts, if you look at the book of the Acts, all of that action takes place under acute persecution. And so the things that we learn about that can give us some very good understanding about how we deal with government when it goes wrong. Go ahead, Mike. Was the church a scapegoat? Was the church a scapegoat for persecution? Um, was things going on in the government they decided to look at Christians as being part of the problem? Um, I'm sure some of that went on, but I think if you look at the overarching reasons for that, is because Christianity threatened the power dynamic, the power structure. Certainly that's what happened in Israel, <coughs> in Judea. It, it, it threatened the dynamic of who is in control and who is in power. 
It was never a dispute that certain things happened. No one disputed that Jesus did miracles. But if people started to listen, listen to Jesus, then if I'm the high priest, I don't become as important anymore. I'm not as special. I'm not as, I don't have enough, the same amount of power. And if people in Judea happen, that happens to them. Now, if I'm Rome, I'm like, man, if people really get a hold of this, then all these nations that we're holding together, it could all become unwrapped. Because this whole Jesus, he, he sets people free. Right? So what Christianity was to most of the power that, to the powers that be was a threat to their power. Right? So um, there were they were taking something out of the Christians as opposed to they saw Christianity as a threat to their position. And they acted accordingly. So, uh, great question though. Any other questions? Or comments? Okay. You're in a safe space, so if you have questions, please let us know. We'll turn the cameras off or I'll edit it out and it'll be fine. Okay. So in the book of the Acts, we see a church dealing with, an emerging church dealing with government going wrong. And there's many stories I can point to, but the one I want to point to is in Acts chapter 4, verses 16 through 21. So, right before this, John and Peter were going to the temple. On their way in, they see a man who's crippled, begging for money. Peter says, listen, I don't have any money, but I'll give you what I do have. Get up and walk in the name of Jesus. And this dude just was telling it. He was screaming and praising God. And, and so, within a very short period of time, everybody knew. Now, the, the chief priests, it's a problem. They thought they dealt with this whole Jesus thing. They thought it was over. Cut off the head, kill the snake, right? That only works if the head stays dead. <laughs> and the head comes back to life. Oh, you got a problem. Right, so, chief priests are like, we have to deal with this. So they arrest Peter and John. They throw them in jail. They don't deny that they healed a man, but they threw them in jail because they were a problem. So where we pick up the action in verse 16, they're kind of stuck, these chief priests. Not really sure what to do. Everything they've tried have failed. They thought they killed Jesus because, and he was the only one going around. Now his followers are going around doing the same thing. It's a leaderless movement now. Everyone in this movement is claiming that their leader is a man who is dead and still talks to them and still leads them. Their leader is a dead man who is alive. How do you stop that? It, it, it's, it's a movement where every single person is empowered to lead in some way. Doesn't matter if you're educated or not. Leader, you can pop up anywhere. Anyone can start doing the same things that, that Jesus, that Nazarene was doing. How do you stop something like that? You can't, obviously. We're sitting here thousands of years later, across an ocean, talking about the same Jesus. But they're trying, I mean, so you got they're trying. So here's what they do. They have a discussion in verse 16. What are we going to do with these men? They asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. 
As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. Glory to the living God. So, the disciples, the apostles, were faced with a terrible situation. Government had gone terribly wrong. They were forbidden from speaking the name Jesus. Now that goes in direct conflict with what God expects from us. So their simple question back was, who do you think we're going to listen to? <laughs> Come on. Let's just be real. We're not going to stop. So you're going to have to do what you got to do. What is incredible about this is that never once did the apostle say, you have no right to punish me. Only in selected circumstances. We're going to talk about that in just a second. They did not deny the power of the authorities to arrest them. In fact, whenever they were arrested, they submitted to whatever punishment came their way. So in that, there's some things that we can learn. <coughs> so let's look at this. When government conflicts with God. So one thing that we can do is draw attention to ways in which government contradicts itself or does not apply the law equitably. We can speak up and point out situations that um, reflect how the government is going about this in the wrong way. I put up two examples. I could have put up, put up a lot more. The first one is when Jesus is in his trial before the Sanhedrin. Uh, remember when he speaks and someone goes up and someone slaps him? And so then what Jesus basically does is he says, this is how legal proceedings are supposed to be. I'm not supposed to be slapped. So why am I being slapped in the court of law when I haven't been condemned of any crime? So he, he did question when government did something very wrong, you're contradicting yourself. Why are you doing this? Also in Acts 22, verses 23 through 29, poor Paul, he had come back to Jerusalem, even though he knew that he would be in prison if he came back to Jerusalem. He comes back to Jerusalem, he cleanses himself, he does all the things that he's supposed to do as a good Jew. While he's doing those things, others are stirring up dissent in the city. And they come and they start a riot over Paul. Paul didn't do anything, he didn't even speak, he's just there, man, he just, he just got there. And suddenly there's this big tumult in the city. Paul gets arrested, and, the, by, and he's being held by the Romans. The Roman centurion, he's not sure what to do. He's like, yeah, let's just flog him and then set him free, right? And so as they're getting ready to hit him, Paul's like, um, listen, is it okay to whip a Roman citizen who hasn't been convicted of a crime? And then the dude just <laughs> panicked. He got really scared because that is a problem. He could be put to death for doing something like that. So Paul did point out, listen, you didn't even have a trial. You, don't, you didn't even know that was a Roman citizen. There's so many things you don't know right here. It's crazy. <laughs> so Paul did point that out. So we can speak up and point out ways in which government either contradicts itself or doesn't apply justice fairly. We can also engage in civil disobedience. However, we should make sure our motives are rooted in God. A lot of times, civil, disobe civil disobedience can be rooted in anger. I mean, we see this when we see riots break out, um, cars overturned and firebombed. And that's not doing the cause or anyone else any good. But civil disobedience should be motivated by love love of others, love of God, love of the country, and not wanting to see a stain on its character. The motivation should be love. Yes? Can you give examples of appropriate civil disobedience? I will in a moment. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so we can, we can, we can, laws that are bad laws that prevent us from loving God and loving on others, we can disobey. 
We just need to be able to submit to whatever comes next. So we, it does not, bad laws do not cancel the Christian's duty to, to submit to government. So if we are disobeying the law, we should expect to be arrested. And we should go ahead and submit to that. Right? Now we have an excellent, now you're already there, so I'm just going to go here. We have an excellent example in our country of appropriate civil disobedience. It's the civil rights movement in the 60s, um, bus boycotts, sit-ins, um, marches. Much of the activity was not in itself illegal. Some of it was. Most of it wasn't. But it was done, if you hear the, the voice of many of the leaders at, at that time, it was done because it was an unjust law. That fair, the laws were unjust and penalized people and hurt people. And if you look at a lot of the words, you know, we hear Dr. King's voice was the, king, the, the voice of the movement. There are many leaders in the civil rights movement, many on many different levels and different arenas. But he's given the prominence of having the voice during that time. And, and he said absolutely great things, far ahead of his time. But if you read his words, he has a deep love for America. Or he had a deep love for America. For all God's children. And he saw what was happening in his country as not worthy of the nation that he loved. And so we need to look at examples of that. That's how we disobey government in a way that is appropriate. Now, of course, things are always done in movements that aren't the best. But overall, what that movement did was overcome evil with love. Thoughts, comments, questions about this? Other examples? Conscientious objectives. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. We had that option. And with in Canada, maybe some were in prison because of their beliefs. Right. The government didn't see it that way. Right, right, right. You know, there's a story of Muhammad Ali refusing to go to Vietnam and he did not feel the, the war is justified. Now I'm not saying anyone's opinion. You know, I'm not talking about whether or not the war is justified, but he believed it to be an unjust war, and he suffered the consequences for that. He, he, he disobeyed, and he submitted to what came next. Those are things that we need to think about. Now, thankfully, we live in a country where our government does not, for the most part, have any laws that prevent us from expressing our faith. Mostly we squawk about laws that we don't like. <laughs> Too much freedom. Now if I were to have two problems, <laughs> too little freedom or too much freedom, I'm going to go over the too much freedom. We don't really have too many causes right now, but too many. There are some that we could stand up for. If we look at, I think across the board, people look at um, mandatory minimums in our legal system as a problem. Um, the, the disproportionate punishment of crack cocaine versus possession of regular cocaine. Things like this are things that we could think about that disproportionately target a certain group and limit freedom for some. Now again, I'm not saying what to do next. I'm not advocating for any particular policy. But I am saying there are arenas in our society where certain groups are unfairly or disproportionately targeted. And I think these are things that we should be concerned about. Yes? And so here, we're thinking about back in, you know, when, during the Civil Rights Movement when there were folks of many races who Technically, the law in the books was that you weren't allowed to ride together in a bus mm -hmm. with mixed, mixed, in a mixed race company. But they did it anyway. Right. To draw attention to the fact that this is an unfair law. And then suffer the consequences for that. But in doing that, it brought attention to something that needed to change. So it was, right. it was illegal. 
right. as far as the law was concerned. But they did it anyway because yes. it was a higher law. The field yes, mindset. and the law contradicted itself. Yeah. So um, the not being able to sit at the lunch counter, separate but equal, mm -hmm. you know, not being able to sit at the lunch counter, where you have a, a set of the population that just by the color of their skin weren't granted the full citizenship of America, that is based on the principles of freedom and all men being equal, it's a contradiction. Yeah. Right? It's a contradiction. Even though morality aside, it's a contradiction of who, who, what America says it is. Right? Go ahead, Mike. The question I hear today is, has government got too big? What is too big? Yeah, yeah, I think that is... So, I think the way it's supposed to be is that government grows and contracts depending on what the country needs at, at, at a particular time. I, I like the idea that we have an oppositional government where we have two sort of ideologies duking it out. Because if things are, if people really are thinking about the people, then at different periods we need different things. Right, so immediately after, coming after World War II, we needed a really, really big government. We needed a lot of social programs. People needed a lot of help. Other times, when we're so prosperous that um, those who are in, who have a lot of money are taking certain, certain liberties, maybe we need a little bit less market, a little bit less government and more tightening of regulation. Maybe we just need to tighten things up a little bit more. You know, so I think at different points, we need different things. So I think the better question is, what do we need right now? What type of government do we need right now for the problems that our country is facing and the needs that we have? Yeah. So uh, again, I talked about this last time, but a lot of times we have a hard time talking about things because we're asking the wrong question. Right? It's not big government is always bad, and or little government is always bad. Or, you know, it, it's not easy. the question is, what do we need right now? What changes do we need to make? Oddly enough, when you ask individual Americans, sort of like the individual policies that our country needs, there's a lot of agreement. Mm -hmm. But the problem is we package them in rhetoric. And then we can't talk. And we can't discuss it. Other thoughts, comments, questions? Great point. All right. So we have this outstanding example to follow from, but we also have the example of those in the Bible who face similar situations. So the bottom line here is when faced with the necessity, again, necessity, this is only when government stands in the way of God's law, of civil disobedience, our protest should be driven by love with the goal of restoration, not destruction, not anarchy. We want to restore. Because we serve a God of restoration. We serve a God of redemption. And we should join him and participate with him in the work that he is doing to restore all things. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that you are a God of restoration, Lord. and You love all of your children, Lord. And I, I pray that you would help us to think differently about politics, to put you in it, Lord God, to put you at the center of all things. Help us to make decisions about policy based on who you are. Help us to vote for candidates that reflect our beliefs about who you are, Lord God. Help us to not just give in to the anger and the rancor that surrounds our politics, but help us to come up higher in you, Lord. Help us to be a sweet aroma in um, this world and in our communities of who you are, Lord, and how you think about things. We thank you so much that we are not bound to do things just like everyone else, that the name of Jesus has set us free to be who you made us to be. Help us to walk in that, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.